Hello friends, welcome to Life After Life Spirit Reports by Alan Kardec. We're basing our weekly study on the beautiful book Heaven and Hell by Alan Kardec, which is part of the codification. And we have been studying the suffering spirits in the last few weeks. And we're reporting live from Northern California. My name is Sunshine Beck and I welcome you very warmly to our beautiful study every Sunday night at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and that's 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I know a lot of you are on the East Coast. So we studied the half, the first half of the spirit called Claire. Claire is a suffering spirit and she essentially lived a very selfish life. She was self-absorbed, she didn't care about much about other people, her heart was hardened. And when she excarnated, she experienced an immense amount of torture and darkness. And we um, read about four, I think, yeah, four of her invocations. She came through a total of eight times to the Spiritist Society in Paris. Um, the first one of its kind, and Alan Kardec was the president. Hello, Tony. So nice to see you. Welcome, welcome, dear friend. And there's others too, and I don't see their names, but please say hello, and also always um, ask questions and clarifications, or if you want to add any information, I love to have it interactive. So please um, let us know your thoughts. So um, she was selfish and she suffered. She was pretty much her own um, worst enemy. So she was tormented by herself. And she, since she didn't care about anyone else in her previous incarnations, what happened is nobody cared about her and her worst pain was not to be surrounded or noticed by anyone. So today we're gonna start off with the fifth invocation. And we don't know how, how long this was after her excarnation, so Alan Kardec does not give us more information on that. But here we go. So she says that um, she wants to speak about us about divine morality and human morality. So on the one hand is the divine morality and on the other side is the human morality. And she says the former, namely the divine morality, assists the adulterous woman in her abandonment and says to sinners, repent and the kingdom of heaven will open to you. So it's very consoling, right friends? So the adulterous woman is being told that, um, is being supported in her abandonment, in, in, in her being judged. And um, the sinner, namely, Let's say, for example, the adulterous woman is being asked to repent and then she too will reach the kingdom of heaven. Then, um, she says, divine morality accepts every repentance and every acknowledgement of wrongs. While human morality, this is in contrast, rejects them and smilingly accepts secret sins, which it says are partially forgiven. The former displays the grace of forgiveness, namely the divine morality, displays the grace of forgiveness. The latter, namely the human morality, hypocrisy. Let us pause for a moment. First of all, hello Renata Casade. Thank you so much for joining, dear friend. And Teresa Castro, it's so nice to have you here. Thank you, thank you. So, um, yeah, so let us look at divine morality a little bit more. So we, we already learned from her that it's about forgiveness. And all of us who have done wrong can reach the kingdom of heaven. We just need to expiate our wrongs. We have in the previous weeks looked at the concepts of repentance, expiation, and reparation before, which is which are the steps that lead us to our recuperation. So first we repent, first we recognize we've done something wrong, and that is usually a very painful moment. I mean, we've all been there. And the next thing is then our desire to want to expiate, and usually expiation happens through a new incarnation. 
we actually for this we could go to um, the spirits book which beautifully explains it I'm just reminded question 990 let's go to the spirits book question 990 because Alan Kardec asked exactly those questions for us and we're so grateful that the spirits the illuminated spirits give us the answers that we're longing for so question 990 which is in the latter part of the spirits book called future joys and sorrows and there's a whole chapter on expiation and repentance where we can educate ourselves we're just going to pick out a few questions so 990 alan kardec asks does repentance take place in the corporeal or the spirit state interesting right do we repent while we're incarnated or only when we're spirits excarnated and the answer is in the spirit state did we know that we are repenting in the spirit state but it may also take place in the corporeal state when you clearly comprehend the difference between good and evil so most likely according to the illuminated spirits we repent we really realize what we've done wrong once we're excarnated but of course we all know we've had moments where we realize my god i made a mistake dang so you know this is no good um so those are the moments during our incarnation where we're realizing i'm repenting then we have question 991 now he's asking what is the consequence of repentance in the spirit state in the spirit state what is the consequence of repentance in the spirit state and the answer is the spirit's desire for a new incarnation in order to purify itself it comprehends the imperfections that have kept it from being happy and it aspires to a new existence in which it can expiate its wrongs here we go so expiation is the desire to have a new life and then undo the past wrongs and that can come in many different forms it can come in a difficult child or um, an adulterous husband or um, an awful mother or father you know what I mean I mean it could be it could be an intolerable boss it could be loss of money it could be a disease so it can come in all different forms and shapes that we expiate during our lifetimes and then um, we're gonna skip over a few questions and you know you can read them all it, it's very interesting 998 now he's asking is expiation accomplished in the corporeal state or in the spirit state actually he's asking pretty much the same question right and he says it is accomplished in the corporeal existence through the trials the spirit must undergo and in the spirit life through the mental suffering arising from its state of imperfection and this mental suffering is what our dear friend claire the spirit we're studying this week is going through incredible torture indescribable pain that we may have a hard time really understanding what that means because right now we're blessed with a body and this kind of torture is a little bit buffered by our physical form plus we have days and nights so we have nighttime where we can sleep hopefully and that's kind of like a reprieve whereas as a spirit she said there is no nighttime it's continuous and seemingly eternal but you and I we know of course she too and all those suffering spirits have their wake up moment when they repent and then they can start the new cycle again so question 999 is sincere repentance during life su sufficient to extinguish a spirit's wrongs and enable it to merit God's grace so if we repent during our lifetime is that sufficient to extinguish our past wrongs and the answer is repentance helps to improve the spirit but the past must be expiated nevertheless so repentance is not enough it's just our first step towards our recuperation so first repentance then expiation and then reparation reparation is making amends so let us see and then question 1000 which is the last one they're just so fascinating aren't they can we redeem our wrongs in the present life so can we start redeeming our wrongs in this lifetime and the answer is yes by making reparation for them so when we 
we realize we've done wrong and we, we repent, while well, expiation is, is leading to a new lifetime, we don't have the luxury of that yet, but we have this blessed opportunity in this physical vessel. And that's when we jump to reparation. We visit those people and we make up for our past wrongs. We apologize. And this is a blessed opportunity not to be missed. All the spirits in all the books recommend do it now, dear friends. That's what they're saying. Repair, um, re, um, make up for the past wrongs right now. Don't carry it over into another lifetime. So that is our invitation to not kick the can, so to speak, down the road, but rather pick it up and trash it. Uh, better yet, recycle it, right? So let us go back here. So um, we were talking about divine morality and human morality. So a more divine morality not only promises the sinner that if the sinner repents, the kingdom of heaven will, will be open to them. So that's beautiful. That's very consoling and very hopeful. It, but it also says to the persecutor, don't judge, only throw a stone if you have never sinned. Jesus taught us that. So we also have a role not to be judges. We weren't born to judge. We were born to do the good and to do, undo the not so good we've done in previous lifetimes. So let us not throw any stones ever. Let us not point fingers. And Emmanuel, in the beautiful book, Thought in Life, in chapter 10, called Understanding, he tells us that understanding is key to all of this. Because if we understand the other, that's the bridge. That's our bridge of love and light. Well, our hearts open and we feel more understanding we feel we can actually make the reparation our judgments dry up and shrivel up and disappear what does he say what does Emmanuel tell us in chapter 10 he says we need understanding as a foundation for the task of our renewal he's very strong and clear in particular in this chapter he says it is our foundation for our own renewal it is the foundation our own renewal we need to understand ourselves that is very important but we also need to understand others and understanding ourselves where it starts is really a meditational process it is soul searching it is going within and asking ourselves why have I done X Y and Z what was the deepest motivation what was the root cause of that and once we take that time and really soul search to find the motivation for our thoughts, for our actions, for our words, that is where healing starts to happen. So he says it's the foundation, it's the first stepping stone for us. And we can't continue without the foundation, right? We all know a house cannot be built without a foundation. So this is really vital. Understanding is vital. And then he says, we must make understanding our most cherished dream, for only love can create in our minds the energy of divine light. So he calls it now the cherished, most cherished dream of us is to seek understanding, to find understanding for the other. Because at that very moment, again, our judgments will die, they will go away. We can accept almost anything when we understand find understanding for whatever happened for that person. In this particular chapter, Emmanuel also tells us that we must, what is he saying? He said, he's like, we must seek goodness. We must feel goodness. We must visualize goodness. And we must mold goodness with all the resources we have. Now, can we imagine? That's a full-time job, right? Now I have to, to quit my job and just do that. That's how it feels like. But then I'm re we're realizing we can actually do both because this is an ongoing theme that we seek and feel and visualize and mold goodness. We can do it during our jobs, during anything we do. We can parallel run, we must parallel run to seek 
visualize and feel and mold goodness. And he says we need to do that to undo the shackles that we have, that we have molded, that we have created against our own soul. So we've created those by doing wrong, making wrong choices. And so part of this whole, um, how should I say, part of this whole um, theme of finding regeneration, namely repentance, expiation, and re reparation, lies visualizing, feeling, molding the good with all the resources we have to undo these shackles we created. So this is really, really strong. That's why we're, we're repeating it so much because this is our work, right friends? It is our work. And I'm seeing friends, Lisa Tellies. Hello, it's so nice to see you, Lisa. Welcome, welcome. And I thought I saw someone else. Please apologize if I don't say hello to all of you. Um, it looks like there's more people than I've said hello to, but I didn't see the names, so I apologize for that. So we have a lot more to say. So anyway, that is the divine morality, super important. And the key for divine, for the morality is understanding. And then of course, when it comes to the human morality, we're, we're very familiar with that, right? We can talk our, ourselves out of reasoning, ourselves out of situations, and then that leads to hypocrisy. We say one thing and we don't walk our talk. And then of course, you know, we're not judging churches or anyone who goes to churches. So that is really important for me that you know that. But we 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 can't find hypocrisy in certain churches, right? So it's just important for us because we're not worried about others so much, but we are we really want to be uh we want to walk our talk. We want to be um cohesive. That is the key. We want to be cohesive. So then number six, now it's her sixth evocation. Can you imagine? He's coming back, she's coming back. And now she has a realization. She's now for the first time saying, I am at peace after all this torment that we can hardly understand how painful that is. She says, I am at peace now and I'm resigned to expiating my wrongs. So it sounds like she is getting ready to accept a new lifetime. She also says, evil is not outside of me. It resides within me. It is I who must change and not exterior things. We possess heaven and hell within us and our wrongs are engraved in our conscience and are easily read on the day of our resurrection. That is a huge realization. And many of us, if not most of us, are grappling with that probably daily because the minute we blame anything or anyone for anything that's happening in our lives may be from a slight feeling of discomfort that comes from something that we blame on the outside and outside influence at that very moment we're already losing this realization that our Claire had namely that it all is inside of us it's never outside so we need to remember when we point one finger, three are always pointing back at us. Law of projection, we can only see outside what is somehow residing inside of us. If you spot it, you've got it, right? So it's all in here. And that's what we need to focus on, always. Um, something else I wanted to say. Oop, it's gone. All right, we're continuing. So evil is not outside of me. And by evil, is it's ignorance, right? It's, it's nothing else but ignorance. It's just not knowing yet. Um, and we all have ignorance, right? That's why we're living on planet Earth. And that's why we're working hard to educate ourselves, to practice the good, to be coherent, and to study these beautiful cases. Because this reality show here is he so helpful for us to... Do it differently, right? Because ideally, we don't want to be a suffering spirit like Claire. So then she says, um, what does she say? So um, she's talking about the realms where the suffering spirits live. She says, spirits, according to their degree of advancement, move about in the environment and that is adequate for their faculties. So it's the law of attraction. So what we think, we emit and we attract. So there's grouping, we're grouping ourselves 
we're surrounding ourselves with the same with the like spirits that emanate the same vibrations that we have and we're talking about ex the excarnated state they cannot conceive of any other realm until progress so these spirits until progress that instrument of the spirit's slow transformation rids them of their inferior tendencies and removes the cocoon of sin so that they can flutter like flutter their wings before launching themselves as fast as an arrow towards God. So she's talking about the fact that there is no escape until the repentance happens, until the wake up call. Remember Andre Luis in the first book that he wrote, No Solar, Astra City is how the film was, was named. Our Home is another title for this book. Remember when he was in the Umbral and they show that so vividly in the movie, how he was lying there just vegetating in pain, surrounded by those ignorant dark spirits. And when the phalange of good spirits came into the umbral to pick someone up, because that particular, like including him at some point, that particular spirit reached this moment of repentance and prayer and asking for help, ready to be rescued. The other souls wouldn't even, they would be mean to them. They would want to push them away or wouldn't even see them because their vibrations, their emanations were so different. Remember friends that the movie is really, dis of course the book is, is much better, but the movie makes it visual. And um, so that's what she's talking about. And she says that we want to find our wings and fly towards God, but this is not happening. That's not happening unless we wake up. And she says, she's cute, she says, I still crawl, but I no longer hate. And I can now conceive of the ineffable happiness of divine love. So she's getting there. She's coming out of this agonizing darkness, this agonizing pain. And we want to go to the Spirit's book, question 112, which helps us to understand the concept, the so-called concept of heaven and hell, which of course we've learned through the ages and the church fathers have cemented that in some of our brains that heaven and hell are specific places where we go and that's the end of it boom the gates close and we're locked up either in heaven or in hell and that is not true we know we who've studied spiritism and of course the book heaven and hell and we've talked about it a few months ago that that's not true the heaven and hell, as Claire teaches us to, resides within ourselves. So question 100, uh, 1012, it is all the way again at the end of the Spirits book in the chapter Future Joys and Sorrows. And here Alan Kardec so wisely asks, are there circumscribed places in the universe that are intended for the punishments and pleasures of spirits according to their merits? Perfect, right? And here is the answer. So are those places, are there those places, right? We have already responded to this question. Yes, we know. Punishments and joys are inherent to the degree of a spirit's perfection. Inherent, inside. Remember Claire said, evil resides within me. It's not out there. The place isn't out there. It's always inside of us. Each spirit carries within itself the source of its own happiness or unhappiness. And since spirits are everywhere, there is no circumscribed or enclosed place for one or the other. As for incarnate spirits, us, the degree of their happiness or unhappiness depends on the evolution of the world they inhabit. So in other words, we're on planet Earth, where pain is still the predominant force, definitely the predominant force for us to learn our lessons. That is our realm of that's the consciousness level we are living on because we haven't really advanced beyond earth yet but when we discarnated it is different it is not just one planet one place it is depending on our inherent merit on our inherent soul development and then he asks in question 113 the next one what is to be understood by purgatory then Physical and mental suffering, friends. Physical and mental suffering. So there is, again, no space of purgatory. 
no specific space. It is our own physical and mental suffering. It's inside of us. It is a period of expiation. It is almost always on the earth that you make your own purgatory. And that is where God enables you to expiate your wrongs. And then he also explains it further. That it is a figurative speech that should not be understood as some definite place, but rather the state of imperfect spirits who are undergoing expiation until they complete purification raises them to the plane of the blissful spirits. And that is what our Claire is talking about too, like the soaring towards God. So none of it is stagnant. Everything is always in motion. Everything depends on us, our willingness to work on ourselves, our inner transformation, the focus we have right now on inner transformation, which will help us for the future. It will put beautiful rose petals into on our path, beautiful seeds in our garden of eternity, whose harvest we will be able to reap down the road. So no fixed place and always space to grow out of. Beautiful, it is so, it's the good news, isn't it? It's the good news, it helps us and it inspires us to keep working, to keep visualizing, feeling, molding the good with all the resources we have. So then Claire comes back a seventh time. Can you believe it? And this time she is complaining and talking about her husband, Felix. So husband Felix, we're going to just pick out a few pieces. It, it, it would be wonderful to read the whole case. It's a long one and, and more detailed, but we're just picking out the highlights. <clears throat> so Felix wanders about in darkness as well, her husband. And he was superficial and frivolous in his lifetimes and very sensual. And he never knew what love and friendship was really was what, what that was all about. So love and friendship was foreign to him, but he was essential, superficial, frivolous spirit during his incarnation. And he now roams about in fear in this strange, dark place where he is. He was also violent because he was weak and he had lived a life of chimeras. Then he will curse the materialism that made him embrace emptiness instead of reality. So he was a materialist as well. So he was an earthling focused on what earth offered to him. We know many spirits of that nature, I'm sure, um, we're surrounded by them. It's planet earth. And so Felix, as a result, was suffering and roaming around in darkness. He was rebellious. So then Alan Kardec is wondering about a few things because he wants to understand this whole chapter of darkness. What is actually meant by darkness? Why do we say that spirits roam in darkness or live in darkness? Both Claire and her husband Felix experienced this emptiness, this darkness. And so he says, and he asked St. Louis this question. So this is really a high source and I, I think we can trust it, right? So here is Alan Kardec. What are we to understand by the darkness in which certain suffering spirits find themselves immersed? Is it the kind of darkness so often referred to in the scriptures? Right? We know that because Jesus was talking about that as well. So here is St. Louis's answer, and it's gonna help us to understand what is meant by this darkness. So essentially it refers to the darkness described by Jesus and the prophets regarding the punishment of evil individuals. Now, I always invite us to replace the word punishment, which is something that was more commonly used in the 19th century than today as consequence. It is the effect of the cause. The cause is our actions and the effect is the harvest that is compulsory. Where we are harvesting, we're reaping the harvest of the seeds we planted and that is the so-called punishment. It is our effect of what we've done before. So it relates to what Jesus said. 
And so it was, however, an allegory because Jesus at the time could not talk about the metaphysical darkness. He had to make it material because of the consciousness of it, of the people during his time. So um, he, so then St. Louis continues, he says, um, the darkness that Jesus referred to is comparable to the intellectual darkness of one who is mentally impaired. So the darkness that these spirits experience on the other side, including our friends Felix and Claire, is a mental darkness. It is something that it's a spiritual darkness, a mental darkness, and it is the result of an impaired mind. Impaired in the sense that it focuses on dark subjects, depression, um, anger, all the lower vibrational uh, emotions, feelings, and thoughts that are attached to that. It is the punishment of those who have doubted their destiny, St. Louis explains further. So this mental darkness, the feelings of melancholy, are the punishment, the consequence of those who have doubted their destiny. They have believed in nothingness. Here it is. They have believed in nothingness and the semblance of this nothingness becomes their torment until the soul makes an effort to turn itself around and forcefully breaks through the web of moral weakness that has seized it. This temporary reduction of the soul to a fictitious nothingness, fictitious friends, nothingness, it's an illusion that they're living in, while it is nonetheless conscious of its own existence, is the cruelest feeling that can be imagined due to the apparent repose it presents. Wow, so here we're learning that this nihilism, this nothingness that these souls suffer from, yet being conscious of the self at the same time. And as Claire had said before, it's this continuous darkness, this suffering, this nothingness. No spirit is around. There is no day, no night. It just meanders on that St. Louis describes as the cruelest feeling that can be imagined, the cruelest suffering that can be imagined. Can we really imagine that, friends? It feels like we need to breathe into that and really let it sink in and meditate on this feeling, on this pain that someone who believes in nothing doesn't know what our destiny is, doesn't know what we've learned here in Spiritism, where we come from, why we're here, where we're going, how that feels. We're going to pause in a minute and talk about it more. I just want to, we just want to finish this section and then we'll talk about it. Or we look at nihilism a little more. It is this forced repose, this nullity of being, this uncertainty that comprises its punishment. The weariness that overcomes it is the most terrible of punishments for or consequences, for it perceives nothing around it, neither things nor beings. That is true darkness for the soul, St. Louis teaches us. It is the darkness of the soul. Let us pause. Let us for a moment look at nihilism. Nihilism is an interesting subject for me personally. Most of you probably know I am of German descent. I was born and raised in Germany and I've realized over the years that I was raised in a very heavily, um, how should I say, um, um, glossed over uh, by, uh, in a country that was very much influenced by nihilism in the 20th century. I grew up in the 20th, so did my parents. My parents were children during the war. And nihilism is something that the German culture has re had really embraced. So let us look, what is nihilism? In short, it is when we ask the question, what is this life for? Why are we here? And the answer is no answer. Empty, no explanation. I was raised with that. So I know how that feels. And, um, so it's an extreme, first of all, I wanted to go to um, 
online here. It says nihilism it actually comes from um, the Greek. Let me see, I found it earlier. Um, nihilism comes from the Greek and says nihil, which is nothing. Um, well, I can't find it right now. It's okay. We're staying with, with this one here. So it is an extreme uh, skepticism. Nothing in the world has a real meaning or existence. It's a rejection of all religions and moral principles. It's a rejection of all moral principles. It is not recognizing Jesus. It is not recognizing Jesus as our guide and model. It's nothing. It's like, why are we here? There's no answer. Can, can we imagine how that feels? It's um, a belief that everything is meaningless, meaningless, senseless, useless. Um, in the arts, in literature, it has expressed itself through existential nihilism. You might have heard about it. It's an existentialism, which is the central philosophy of the 20th century. And its origin is in Central Europe, and the Germans really took that ball and ran with it. I even read that the two Second World Wars taking place as an origin in Germany were linked to this nihilistic worldview, opening up the Germans to the regime of, 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 of someone like Hitler just taking over, losing all concepts of um, a government, a dictator taking over and somehow that's related to this worldview of nihilism. It argues life is without meaning. One of the examples which is linked to the British culture is Macbeth. And another one who is German is Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche is huge in, in the German culture. And he wrote the book, um, it was, yeah, Friedrich Nietzsche and his nihilistic outlook. And then there was Albert Camus, Albert Camus, a French man, who wrote this very famous book, um, The Myth of Sisyphus. Sisyphus was this guy who was trying to push a rock uphill and it kept rolling back down. <gasps> and he kept pushing it back uphill and it kept coming back down. Can we imagine how hopeless this is and then of course you know Franz Kafka some of you might have heard him Franz Kafka he called the human condition absurd he went so far he, he took it to more deep deeper extremes he called the human condition absurd the human race was a product product of one of God's bad days Friends, I think you're getting the idea. It is a very depressing way of looking at life. And what would we do if we were here? We wouldn't know why this doesn't make sense. I'm suffering. What for? Well, I mean, it is an open invitation to to alter ourselves, to, to take drugs and and to, to numb the mind, to maybe even take our lives. And we're wondering how many young people who are taking their lives these days or are going on shooting rampages are somewhat living that worldview of just not seeing any sense in it, not being able to make sense of it, to feel alone, to feel surrounded by nothingness, not knowing why they're here in this world. Yes, my father was a product of nihilism and it took his life and my mother wasn't far behind him. So, but we don't want to talk about our own story so much. Um, I'm just trying my best to bring across the concept of the pain, the result, the painful result of nihilism, believing in nothingness, which our two friends, Claire and Felix, have suffered from, for a while at least. And it caused them a lot of pain. So then Claire chimes in as well. Well, 
this concept of darkness, yes, uh, it's rooted in nothingness, but I can say something to that too. She's cute. She says, I can also respond to the question because I've suffered through it for a long time. And then she says, this is now Claire's read on this darkness, such regions that are populated of, in, of, of, in, of spirits are darkness indeed, she says. They are peopled and deserted at the same time. They're deserted because these spirits can't perceive anything. It's so dark for them. They're just totally alone. They're caught up in their pain. I've seen it in my father. They are people, my father was a, was a philosopher. He was a professor. He was a very intelligent man. He was a philosopher. He inhaled all these, um, this, this literature and he was, you know, talking about it at every dinner table. So I, I've got my dose, <laughs> but for some reason, this is what's interesting. You know, we're all different as spirits. It just never really took a hold of me. Yes, a little bit, of course, I have it in me. I have an understanding of it, but I always thought, well, that doesn't really make sense. There's got to be more. And it actually helped me to really seek my whole entire life, to seek for answers. And I didn't rest. And I feel I finally found my home and more answers than I even had questions for the first time in my life, thanks to spiritism and the spirits, illuminated spirits. So I feel like I, I have reached my goal of finding the answers. And I knew I had a hunch. I had an intuition. I knew there was more nihilism wasn't the answer so she says yeah so they're empty and at the same time peopled spaces in which obscure spirits roam around in mourning without consolation without affection and without any help whatsoever they feel the weight of eternity pressing down on them they tremble and mourn the petty interests on which they spent their time can we can we understand that? They tremble and mourn the petty interests on which they spent their time. They regret the absence of nighttime. For a spirit, darkness means ignorance, emptiness, the horror of the unknown. Some of us have some fear of excarnation and maybe in general, or maybe just of the moment, the actual transition. It's based on ignorance, not knowing what to expect, right, friends? And that's why we're doing this study, so that we can feel more, com more comfortable with this concept of inevitability. We all will excarnate and we can prepare ourselves. So we're kind of um, preparing our toolbox. We're stuffing our toolbox with lots of tools and we're applying them to all the vicissitudes of life. And so to be ready, right, friends? So let us see, we have um, one more. We have one more explanation of darkness, which also came from St. Louis at a different time. So here he adds now, the Paris spirit has a luminous property that develops under the influx of the soul's activities and qualities. So now St. Louis, adds another aspect of explanation of this darkness and he links it to our Paris spirit because the Paris spirit is, has luminous properties but it, they depend, the luminosity of our Paris spirit is linked to our soul development, how much light we carry, how far we have already transformed ourselves towards becoming more godlike. Then he says, one could say that these qualities are for the Paris spiritual fluid what friction is for the match. The intensity of a spirit's light is the result of its purity. So I say that again. The intensity, the luminosity of a spirit's um, light is the, the intensity of a spirit's light is the result of its purity. The least moral imperfection dims and weakens it. So the less moral imperfections we have, the more pure we are already as a spirit, the more luminous we are as spirits. Our peri spirit becomes more luminous. And this is important because we're talking about the explanation of darkness. 
Thus, the spirit is, in a manner of speaking, its own beacon and will see according to the amount of light it produces. Interesting. This means that spirits who do not produce any light at all find themselves in darkness. He explains it a little bit further, though. There is another aspect to it. But we are reminded at this very moment, so we understand that our luminosity, the radiance of our perispirit is, is dependent on our purity, the soul purity, right? The less we have imperfections, the more bright we, our light shines. And we're reminded of Jesus. He said, let your light shine, right? And we have these beautiful songs. You know, I'm not going to attempt to sing again this time. But, you know, let our light shine, this little light of mine. Let it shine. Let our light shine. And how do we best let our light shine? By working on our inner transformation, on seeking the good, on feeling the good, visualizing the good, molding the good with all the resources we can muster, with all the energy. Every day we are going to the gym of the soul and putting another ring on our little, on our little weight for our little soul weight so it becomes stronger, we become more pure. So then the explanation continues by St. Louis and he says, this theory is perfectly exact as to the radiation of higher order spirits, luminous fluids. It has been confirmed by observation. Although this does not imply the real cause, cause or at least the sole cause of the phenomena of darkness, given that first, not all low order spirits are in darkness, Second, the same spirit can find itself alternately in light and darkness. And third, light is also a punishment for highly imperfect spirits. So on some level, we are our own light once we've excarnated. And the least developed we are, the more in darkness we reside. However, it's not that's not the sole reason. This could be one aspect because some lower order spirits live completely in brightness and that is their expiation. That's their um, pain because they don't like the light. They like to be in darkness. Right? We're all different and as spirits, we're all different too. <laughs> Tony, I am not sure, but thank you so much for being so kind for seeking kindness, seeing the good in me. <laughs> so anyway, so let's go back. So first, not all low order spirits are in darkness and we keep the lower order spirits can oscillate. They can also go into lightness. It really depends on the case. In this particular case of Felix and Claire, they were stuck in darkness and that was their expiation, so to speak. That was their, it's not expiation. We'll, we will say this was their consequence not punishment but their consequence which was appropriate for their soul growth then um he continues to say if the darkness in which certain spirits find themselves were inherent to their personality such darkness would be permanent in general for all evil spirits which is not the case so it is very logical then he says everything indicates that regardless of their own light spirits also receive light from the outside which is denied to them according to the circumstances. So in the case of Felix and uh, Claire, the light was denied to them. That's exactly what they needed to wake up, to find repentance, to see what they had done wrong in their lifetimes, which was for Claire primarily being selfish, self-centered, and not having a heart towards other people, always just thinking about herself, and for Felix, he was very superficial, he was violent and very sensual, which are all attributes that don't really help us to um, in our inner transformation. They bind us to the earth. And both of them didn't really know why they were here. They were subscribed to nothingness and that caused them the darkness. So um, let us see. There is one more question, but we will stop right here and we will take this question into our next meeting. 
which will be, and this is just a little preview, why is the moral education of discarnate spirits easier than that of incarnates? We will cover that next week and see why it is easier for excarnates to morally trans um, grow. And we will also, most likely, so God willing, um, cover next week the training for death by the spirit Umberto de Campos or Brother X. And it will help us to prepare ourselves, which is really important. Joanna de Angelis, one of the main spirits that is um, coming through Gibaldo Franco, always says, we must think about our excarnation at least once a day. It helps us to wiggle these ties a little bit loose and it helps us to not be too attached to anything. So dear friends, let us close, if you can, for a moment your eyes and let us revel in gratitude to God, to our beloved Jesus Christ, our guide and model, and the beautiful illuminated spirits who grace us daily with so much illuminating information, helping us in our inner transformation to undo the shackles of evil we have forged against our own soul. As Emmanuel teaches us, we must seek goodness, we must visualize goodness, we must feel goodness, and we must mold goodness with all the resources we can muster. And we are asking for guidance in the week to come to work on our inner transformation, on doing the good, on becoming more charitable every single day, more benevolent, indulgent, and forgiving, and understanding why we're here and where we're going and where we came from, so that we will not fall into the trap of nothingness, helping us to stay positive and loving and grateful always. And with this, we humbly ask for permission to close our gathering, our intercontinental classroom for the night. And so be it. Dear friends, Nor, Brazil, Tony, and everyone else, Lisa Tellis, Teresa Castro, Renata Casadei, and more, thank you so much for joining. And so God willing, we will meet next week, next same time again, and continue our studies, our preparation. God bless you. Good night, friends.